Welcome back. Uh, we are now at part two of this week's new comics, bitches. So uh, we're gonna we're actually gonna start in a little bit different of a place now. Uh, Carnival of Sins uh, Zero, I believe. Uh, if, um, if you know him, he has his own. He's a YouTuber, uh, you know, uh, Christian Casares. Uh, we correspond a lot on Twitter. He basically asked me, uh, because I've been, you know, I've been talking, you know, a lot of people have been recommending X-Force, him kind of particularly, uh, and he basically said, you know, I have a copy of the first arc of Uncanny X-Force, do you want it? So I said, eh, okay, uh... I sent him, of course, uh, V for Vendetta in return because he says that he had never read any Alan Moore, which to me was, you know, my head almost exploded because how can you be, you know, and he's a really avid comic collector, so um, it was it was just very surprising to me that he hadn't read any Alan Moore because his work is kind of, you know, the basis of kind of where we are right now. Uh, you know, him and Frank Miller, essentially, you know, and, and arguably Howard Chaikin are pretty much, you know, they're kind of like the fathers of the, uh, you know, the, the more kind of uh, adult movement in comic books, the more mature movement. So uh, he sent me uh, the first arc. Uh, it's a hardcover, a nice premiere edition of uh, Uncanny X-Force, The Apocalypse Solution. Um, I have to say, I had a terrific time reading this. I thought it was very smart. Um, you know, terrific art. Uh, I, uh, uh, you know, Rick Remender really seems to know what he's doing here. I didn't find, uh, Deadpool as annoying as I have found him, um, you know, I, I, I do I do really dig Phantom X. I dig the relationship that uh, that Angel that Angel and Cyclops or Cyclops Psylocke have, and of course there's Wolverine, um, who now this is basically entirely Black Ops now. I mean, not even Cyclops has any oversight on what X Force does, which it, you know it does bring it in a much different direction. Um, so. Uh, you know, ultimately, it was just, you know, really just terrific stuff. I, I really enjoyed it, and I am going to be getting uh, some more arcs, because I do want to get to, uh, you know, arguably what's been the most important, which is the arc of, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the final arc of the, the Dark Angel saga, which... You know, is being touted right now in pretty much every Marvel comic. You know, it's a two uh, two page spread is you know the best arc of any recent comic. You know, it's the the big kind of banner uh, ad. You know, the big kind of banner uh, review that it shows in its kind of two page spread ad that's in just about every Marvel comic. So, uh, again, thank you for that, Christian. Uh, it's it was a terrific read, and yes, I am going to get more into. Uh, Uncanny X Force when I return to work and have more money. Uh, so moving on, uh, this is something I didn't get to review from last week because I didn't get it until uh, from I'm sorry from the week previous because I didn't get it until last Wednesday, and that is Captain America and Bucky number six twenty seven. Now we're really closing in on the end here uh, of this series because I believe in April it's going to. Uh, it's going to Captain America and Hawkeye, in which case I'll probably check out the first issue, but more than likely I will be dropping it because, you know, with Ed Brubaker not involved anymore, uh, it's just not going to have the same pull that it had for me before. Um, and I, I think there's only so far that you can go with Captain America and Hawkeye. You know, we're seeing a lot of that being played out right now in Secret Avengers, so I, I just don't really know how much further they can take it. Um, which is why I liked Captain America and Bucky, because it, you know, before this, it was telling tales of the old, you know, the kind of wartime Captain America, and that's, I, I really gravitated a lot more towards that than this particular arc. However, this particular arc is still really good. Um... You know, we've got, you know, we've got Cap fighting all of the uh, kind of uh, Adam 
androids. Uh, you know, we had the big reveal of, of, of last issue, uh, which is that um, uh, um, <laughs> that's uh, uh, that William Naslin the third is actually Adam three, uh, you know, kind of the improved version of Adam two that killed uh, the. Uh, original William Naslund uh, back, you know, just post World War II, uh, just after you know it was believed that Cap and Bucky had died, and so you know we have everything kind of going on here with Fred Davis, you know, the the, the old man Fred Davis, uh, and you know just a lot of stuff going on here with uh, Adam Three and the original Human Torch, Jim Hammond, um, and then we have. You know, this big fight between Cap and these android Buckies and Caps, uh, you know, which does, you know, there's a, there's something deeper at work here. Now, we also have, you know, we have James Asmus and, and Brubaker doing the plotting. James Asmus is actually doing the writing. And we have Francesco Francavia, easily one of my favorite artists working right now, doing the art. And just when it comes to pages like this... You know that's just that's just golden right there. So um, this is a very solid four out of five for me. Um, I uh, it's a nice twist at the end. Uh, I feel that it does lack a little bit something. Um, it certainly has nothing to do with Frank Avia's art because just on that merit alone gets it just about a four out of five. Uh, but you know, comic book can't be entirely art. You know, just look at Justice League for Christ's sake. But um, you know, there's there's some real stuff going on here, and it's very interesting. And uh, but it just it, it still falls a tiny bit flat. But again, I can't say anything bad about Frank Villa's art because his art is just it's tremendous. It's you know, like I said, it's one of the best uh, artists in the biz. Um, so moving along, uh, we'll do this one first. Uh, so we've got uh, the Ultimates number seven. Now this, again, you know, we have Jonathan Hickman writing this. Uh, we've got Saad Ribic coming back doing the art, and of course he's phenomenal as an artist. Uh, this book, uh, a very solid four and a half out of five. A little bit more towards four. Only be you know Hickman. He's a high concept guy. I you know don't want to sound too much like a broken record, so I'm just going to stop there. And what's going on in the Ultimates is extremely high concept. I mean, it's very much you know akin to what he's doing with Fantastic Four and FF and what he did with the Red Wing, and you know he's coming you know the Manhattan Projects that's coming out uh, soon that he's going to be working on. All of these very high concept ideas. He is definitely aiming for the smartest person in the audience. Um, nothing goes to waste. That is definitely one thing about uh, Hickman, is that nothing really goes to waste. Everything does end up fitting together. Uh, but, you know, we do, we're do. we definitely dealing with the fallout of Ultimate Comics Hawkeye, which Hickman also wrote about the you know the, uh, the you know the the, the heavenly city of uh, uh, Tian and the twins Zorn and Zorn, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know one of them is a little bit more warlike and the other one's more peaceable. And basically, what they're trying to do, as the Ultimates are trying to do, is they're trying to recruit the you know the people of Tian to their cause and it doesn't work quite so well because Reed Richards is kind of a step ahead pretty much the entire way uh, so even when things look like they're about to go right they end up going wrong but uh, as they say in the great uh, Super Bowl trailer for the Avengers uh, you know, one man, you know, Loki says to Tony Stark, I have an army. And Tony Stark replies, we have a Hulk. That's Ultimates number seven. 
four out of five. <laughs> because the Hulk... I, I, I love the Ultimate Hulk. I do. It's, I... I did love him a little bit more when he was, you know, kind of this crazed, horny, eating people, you know, guy that uh, Mark Miller made him into. But, you know, beggars can't really be choosers, and Ultimate Hulk is still pretty fucking cool. So, uh, moving on in the Ultimates category, uh, we have Ultimate X-Men number eight. Uh... This is, the next couple of issues are really going to determine whether or not this stays in my pull box. Because again, this is pretty disappointing. I wanted, I keep wanting to like this because it's Nick Spencer. I love Nick Spencer. I think he's a great writer. And this has just been kind of, it's been kind of confusing. Uh, it doesn't really seem, you know, it seems very all over the place. Like, one second we are here, the next second we're there, and now we're dealing with the Ultimate X team. Now, I know nothing about Ultimate X except, you know, who's on it. And that's one person that I know who's on it. So, you know, a lot of it's very conversational-based, a lot of exposition as far as, uh, you know, stuff about Tion and, uh, you know, and how Ultimate X is essentially sent to save on behalf of Tian and on behalf on Zorn, behalf of Zorn, uh, one of the Zorns, uh, to save a, a bunch of uh, kids from a slaver ship. Um, that's kind of like main action that goes on here, and that moment itself is is pretty cool. I mean, the the rest of the issue is not bad. It's just not what I expect from Nick Spencer. So. Uh, you know, because I really want this to be a lot more like what it was kind of building up to. Because it did take a while, you know, there was like, you know, the first three issues or so, it, and then like issues four, five, and six were like, you know, they just kept gradually getting better and better. And then the last issue was just not really worth my time or my interest. Um, and, you know, it had, you know, the whole reveal of Magneto uh, still being alive had no real, you know, shock value to it after, of course, the resurrection of Professor X. So, uh, here we have... Now, I, I don't even know kind of what happened with Jean Grey, uh, but apparently she's brainwashed the entire world into, you know, uh, supposedly brainwashed the entire world into thinking that she is somewhere else when she's not. And there's this whole conversation with Val Cooper and Nick Fury. Uh, you know, Val is, you know, she's very invested in, you know, kind of the mutant project. And so, you know, it's... I don't know, I just wanted to like it more. It's, it's a three out of five. You know, just, it's, it's better than the last issue, but it's still not that good. And again, there seems to be, you know, not much of a reveal here, but I, I was just really confused at the end. And again, maybe that's part of the purpose, but I'm not seeing it right now. So, again, I'll continue on with it. I'll soldier forth and, uh, and continue to keep giving it a chance uh, for the next couple of issues. But like I said, these issues better really start picking things up. Um, get back down to Earth, as it were. Um... Just a real brief tidbit here, just a real brief review of FF number 15. Um, I'm glad that uh, Bombo Bio is not doing the art here. I did enjoy this uh, this issue. You know, Power Pack comes into play here. Uh, you know, Franklin Richards speaking to the future version of himself. And now we have finally crossed axes, and FF has finally caught up with what's going on in Fantastic Four. We now are exactly at the same point. So on that merit alone, I give this three and a half out of five. It's good. It's not great. Um, uh, I think this is what, Nick? Yeah, Nick Dragata, uh, you know, a much better artist than Bobbio, and Hickman, you know, keeps keeps going with, uh, with his stuff. So, uh, We'll be back in just a minute with uh, the rest of uh, this week, including my picks of the week, so stay tuned.